Hello, my name is Gertrude Luwadzano Munyaradzi Mache, and I am the CEO and founder of the Africa Alive Education Foundation. Today's presentation will explain to you my passion, which really is to help children affected by HIV and AIDS in Africa. We fundraise for their school fees, for their food, for their medication. The presentation will explain itself. Enjoy. Good evening, everyone. I'm absolutely honored to be here today. My name is Getrud Ruadzano Munyara Zimache. I was born on one of the most fascinating continents in the world. Africa is a harsh continent, but it prepares you to live anywhere. Up until the 29th of March this year, I had not quite known what my life purpose was. That was the day that my youngest brother died of AIDS. I realized at that point that my voice, my body, my very being in this incarnation is merely a channel the Creator is using to awaken the world. A lot of people ask me, Gertrude, are you the typical African woman? I can only tell you honestly that no, I'm not. What I do know is that I was born to be her voice and the voice of her children. Let me tell you a little bit about the typical African woman. In my country, and when I say my country, I am talking about Africa from North to South Africa. The typical African woman is at the bottom of the food chain. The typical African woman is always the last to eat. Her role in society is to fetch the water, fetch the firewood, make the fire, prepare the food, prepare the fields for sowing, sow the seed and harvest. And in most situations, she does this single-handedly. And at the end of her exhausting day, she's the last to eat the leftovers of her prepared meals. In my country, the typical African woman is physically and psychologically abused. In times of war, she is raped and she personifies the downtrodden human being. Now, while all this is happening to her, she asks you, where are you, my father, when my education is sacrificed? Where are you, my brother, when I toil in the field and in the kitchen? Where are you, my sister, when my genitals are cut from my body with a sharp knife? Where are you, my aunt, where are you, my mother? It is your hands, your strength that pin me down. In times of war, when I am gang raped, sometimes by five, six, ten men, where are you, my father, when I am violated? Where are you, my God? Where are you, my fellow human being? Why do you allow this to happen to me? Now, because I'm not the typical African woman, I'm going to share with you today the spiritual journey that has been my life. I was born in a small village called Wedza on the eastern highlands of Zimbabwe and Mozambique. It's the kind of place where you are born there, you'll die there, and you'll amount to absolutely nothing. But I was blessed to be given two amazing parents. My parents put me through private school from day one. At a time in Rhodesia with racial segregation, African children were receiving a substandard education. And the way they did it is they taught me how to use my hands. By the age of six, I had learned how to knit, how to crochet, how to sew, how to fabric paint. And we would make crafts in our house during the weekends. Then we'd go to all the white neighborhoods and sell. My mother can sell snow to the Eskimos. Sand to the Arabs of the desert. She's an amazing salesperson. 
And they gave me the principles that have really made me who I am. And I'm really honored that my dad is here. <laughs> and your being here tonight and responding to this invitation has just blown us away as a family. Just before we came, he said, give me your phone, I've got to call your mother. Mum is here. They came back after my brother's funeral, but because I talk about him in my presentations, she didn't want to be here. And I overheard the conversation, and he was describing this theater and the number of people who are coming. So thank you, thank you, thank you for taking the time to share tonight with me. So how did I get to New Zealand? I can only say the wind blew me here. <laughs> I wasn't coming to New Zealand. In August 2001, I was headed for America. My husband and I had lived in South Africa for seven years, and we went back to Zimbabwe to find our economy in ruins. I don't know if you know about Zimbabwean politics, but that was the time of the land invasions. Farmers were being murdered. Anyone who had a passport was leaving Zimbabwe. So we went on the internet, and I said to my husband, maybe I should try and go to the United States, see if my artwork will sell, and find a safe place for us to immigrate. I traveled for four months all over the United States and took my hand-painted fabrics with me. You might have seen some in the foyer. And my work was selling like hotcakes. African-American women love the clothes that I make out of the fabric. So I went back to Zimbabwe and I said to my husband, the United States. Now, we didn't have enough money for air tickets for the whole family. So we paid for tickets for me and the three children, who at that time were aged 3, 10, and 12. And I got on an airplane from Harare, flying, flying through South Africa. We stopped in Joburg for one hour. And when we went to check in after an hour, the lady who was serving me picked up an error on my daughter's visa. The U.S. Embassy had transposed the last two digits of the passport number on the visa sticker. Small little typo. Instead of one and two, they put two and one at the end. They told us we could not proceed. We had to go back to Zimbabwe. I went back to the U.S. Embassy to try and get them to correct the error, and they apologized and said, we're really sorry. Too many Zimbabweans are leaving the country. We had to change our rules a week ago. You now need to show you're financially stable. Come back with a bank statement with $6 million, and we'll correct the error. <laughs> they refused to change an error that they had made. I remember sitting at home and crying and thinking, what kind of a god would do this to me? I was on that plane. I was going to safety with the kids. We lost everything. I tried to go back to the airline to get a refund on the air tickets. They said, we're sorry. These are cheap Apex tickets. If you don't fly on those dates, you don't get a refund. We literally lost our entire life savings. A month later, September 11 happened, and we watched in horror when the Twin Towers came down. Because if I had got on that plane, I would not be here speaking to you today. I was going to be working in a building that went down on September 11. I was spending two weeks in New York. My end destination was New Orleans. I paid a deposit to rent a house in New Orleans that disappeared two years later with Hurricane Katrina. <laughs> <laughs> and when I look back at my life eight years later, I know I was supposed to come to New Zealand. So I had a cousin who was living in Wellington, and she was surfing on the internet one day on the Hotmail address book, found my misspelled name. You might have all picked up on that. My name is Gertrude Mache. There's an R in Gertrude missing. And she wrote this one-line email saying, Gertrude, this is Priscilla. I'm in New Zealand. Please get in touch. So I wrote back to her, and I told her what had happened. She said to me, Gertrude, if you have faith, find that money. Get on the next plane. Come to New Zealand. You won't regret it. So as an act of faith, we sold a house we owned in Cape Town, and I got on the next plane, arrived in Wellington on the 1st of November, 2001. 
When I got to the airport, my cousin was a bit shocked that I came with the children. She had said, look, if you're coming, come alone. I can put you up on my couch, but if you bring your three children, I've got four teenage kids, it's not going to work. So I'm at the airport and I'm trying to hide three children behind my back. <laughs> and the look on her face said, I cannot do this. You know how somebody communicates without words? She took us home and we spent the first two days in her house. I remember it was a Tuesday when I got here. We were so jet lagged, we were sleeping on the floor in her lounge. On Thursday evening, she came home from work and she said, look, let's drive around the city, I'll show you Wellington. So we went to a number of neighborhoods and on the way back to Karori, we stopped in Kandala. Anybody know Wellington? Most expensive neighborhood in Wellington. And we were standing outside Harcourts, reading the signs and prices of houses. And I was converting into Zimbabwean dollars and thinking, oh my gosh, I could never live here. And this woman came out of the building, it was 8 o'clock at night, introduced herself to me. Her name is Trudy Flynn. So we kind of hit it off on the name Gertrude initially. Trudy speaks Dutch, I speak a bit of Afrikaans, and in her broken Dutch and my broken Afrikaans, we became friends. And I said to her, look, I've just arrived, I've got three kids, I've got to find somewhere to stay. She said to me, do you see that apartment down the road? I said, yes. She said, that belongs to my sister-in-law, Helen. It's been empty for three months. I'll talk to Helen, see if she can reduce the rent until you find work. I arrived in New Zealand on a Tuesday. By Friday, I had moved out of my cousin's house into an empty three-bedroom apartment in Kandala. The lady who owned the apartment reduced the rent until I got a job, and it was just magical. Trudy told everybody in my street in Nicholson Road that there's a new family in town. If anyone had anything to give away, they should come and see me. My neighbors came and knocked on the door and said, get rude, I've got a bed. I've got a couch, I've got a chair, I've got pots, I've got pans. By Sunday, I had a fully furnished house. My New Zealand experience has been unique. And I need to thank all of you for who you are. Do you know Kiwis are special in the way you welcome outsiders? You have to realize how hard it is for us to be here. Being in a new environment, you've left your parents, you've left everybody you know, and you know no one. Just having somebody smile at you in a supermarket can make your day. And I remember just not hearing my language spoken on a daily basis made me go crazy. But the people who embraced us in that community made it home for us. So I was struggling to try and find a job. I was trained as a systems analyst, so in that year there was a lot of IT work in New Zealand. So I sent my CV out all over the city and the response was awesome. By the end of the second week, I had five interviews lined up. My older two children started school straight away, but the challenge was the little ones. The little guy was three. Fifteen dollars an hour for childcare. I couldn't afford it. I had two thousand dollars in my purse. And I was in Pack and Save for Tony one day, buying vegetables. And this woman, and I hope Jaylene is here today. Jay, are you here? Oh, okay, your daughter is here. I can hear she's here. <laughs> this woman comes up to me in the vegetable section, and she says, excuse me, where are you from? And I said, I'm from Zimbabwe. She said, do you know I'm from Zimbabwe too? And I had a breakdown in Pack and Save for Tony. I just started crying. <laughs> And I said, you know, I've just arrived, I've got three kids, I have got to find work, and there's no one to look after my son. And this girl just put her basket down and hugged me, total stranger. And she said, don't cry. I came with my mom, and if you trust us, we will watch your son for you. I didn't have a car, they lived in Wainui Mata. If anybody knows Wellington, that's like 40 kilometers away. <laughs> so I told Trudy, and I said, Trudy, I've got to find a car. I found someone to look after, do me. And Trudy's son sold me a car for $500. So I would drive to Ainui every day, drop off my son, and by the end of that second week, I had three job offers. So I took a job working as a systems analyst, and this company just was wonderful. 
It took me three months to make enough money for my husband's air ticket. So when he came to New Zealand, the Medical Council of New Zealand took eight months to give him registration. He was sitting at home for a couple of months and he said, look, I can't do this. So he went on the internet and he found hundreds of jobs in Australia. So he flew to Mount Aweza. Anybody from Queensland here? When he got there, he said, Gertrude, stay where you are. <laughs> <laughs> they had put him in an outstation in the back of the beyond and he said, I'll commute back and forth until the registration goes through. But we didn't know it was going to take a whole year. So for the first year of my stay in New Zealand, I was here alone with three small kids, trying to hold down a full-time job, and I was losing it. So when Barton came home, I decided to talk to my boss and renegotiate my work hours so I could work from home in the afternoon, go to the office in the morning. But the day I approached my boss, he was in a very bad mood. This man stood in his office and he said, Gertrude, I'm sorry, it's either you stay or you go. There's no choice. And I thought, well, he's asking me to choose between my children and work. And my kids aren't negotiable. So I resigned on the spot. I came home and told my poor husband who was still job hunting that I quit my job. <laughs> and I said, don't worry, I'll go back to my fabric painting. I'll go back to my art. Maybe I can make a living from it. So I started painting my fabric. And I painted a hundred meters of material, three meters in length, and I went all over Wellington trying to sell this fabric. Everywhere I went, people would say to me, it's beautiful, but can you paint ferns? <laughs> or can you paint fish? I was painting zebras and giraffes and African animals. And I was trying to sell an African product in New Zealand, and it just wasn't working. And then one night, I had this dream. I dreamt of my grandmother, who I'm named after. Now, I'll explain the misspelled name. <laughs> my grand was brought up in a German orphanage. At a time when colonialists came to Africa, they would forcibly remove children from their parents and bring them up in orphanages. So she didn't know her African name. She did not know her parents. And she says when she learned to read and write the English language, she dropped the R in Gertrude as an act of defiance. She decided to get rude. She says the nuns would beat her until she was black and blue, and she refused to change her name. So when I was born, she named me after her. And in Africa, when you name a child after you, it means you will never die, because people say your name on a daily basis. So if I correct the spelling, it loses the essence of who my gran grandmother was, so I've kept my misspelled name for that reason. And she's my spiritual guide. She had died 10 years before this, but she came to me in this dream, larger than life, and she was speaking in English, fluent English. She hated English. She had her hands on her hips, and she said to me, Gertrude, if you have a problem, break it up into small pieces. 2 a.m. in the morning, this dream makes no sense. I went back to sleep, woke up at 6 o'clock, and I realized what the dream meant. It's now a principle I apply to everything I do in business. I got out my scissors, cut my fabric into small pieces. Now, you might have seen the cushions in the foyer. I made a thousand cushions and sold a thousand cushions in three months at $25 a piece and formed my first business in New Zealand, which was a little shop that sold hand-painted cushions. My kids could walk from school and come to the shop in the afternoon. It was just magical. And I ran the shop for a year, but I found that I was making more money exporting these cushions to the United States. I was using the internet, I was on internet websites, internet auctions. So I kept the shop for a year, then I closed it at the end of the first financial year and took the business home. While I was sitting in this shop waiting for customers to come in, I started thinking about other business ideas I could implement. And when my husband was job hunting, we saw hundreds of vacancies on the internet for health professionals. And I said to my husband, there's a shortage of doctors here. I want to see if I can recruit doctors. So I rode back to Africa to all our friends, and five of my husband's colleagues said, wow, you're in New Zealand, we'd love to come for a year. So I placed five doctors, and I made $125,000 in three months sitting in my bedroom, slippers at home. I hit on a million-dollar idea. 
So I formed a company called Medical Recruiters of New Zealand, and that's what we do. We bring in doctors, nurses, anyone medical into New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and the Emirates. So that has been my bread and butter. Then the next company I formed was when Peter Jackson was filming King Kong. I went to a presentation where they were talking about how they made Lord of the Rings. And I'm sitting in the audience thinking, gosh, I wouldn't mind taking part in Peter Jackson's next film. You know how you think of these crazy things? So I put up my hand during the question and answer session. And I said, look, how are you recruiting for film? They said, why? I said, well, I know you're working on King Kong, and I used to do a bit of acting in Zimbabwe, and I, I wouldn't mind taking part. So this lady says to me, oh, okay, well, why don't you email your photograph and a CV? Someone in our office will get in touch. I met them on a Thursday. Friday, I got a call from Weta. And they said to me, Gertrude, how many Africans do you know in Wellington? I said, I know quite a few people. Why? They said, we actually need 350 African extras for one scene. <laughs> and I thought, oh my gosh, this is a business. And I said to them, if I come up with those numbers, can I come and present it as a business case? They said, sure, come on Tuesday. I called my friend, Yvonne, here in Napier. Now, a lot of you know Yvonne. I said, Yvonne, there's this opportunity. You've got to call your friends. And Yvonne went crazy. I got to her house, and she was, it was like a party. People were lining up in the street to have their photographs taken. I went through Havelock, Palmerston North, Wellington. We were on the bus in supermarkets hitting on anyone brown. <laughs> <laughs> they ended up having to spray paint people so they all looked the same color. <laughs> and I went and presented this business case, and Weta said, wow, can you a contract. So I supplied the African extras who took part in King Kong. Then they told me that I didn't get the part I had auditioned for. <laughs> Peter Jackson said I was too fat. <laughs> they picked tall, lean, thin people, so they all looked like they were from the same tribe. And I had chubbed out a bit since I got here. And my sister, who was new from Zimbabwe, got a part. They did give me a part in the New York scene. Now, I was cast as an uptown girl and a downtown girl. As the uptown girl, I was wearing makeup, high heels. I was going to look good on big screen. As the downtown girl, I was a servant walking on the streets of New York after work. When I went in for the wardrobe fitting, they told me Peter Jackson had changed his mind again, and I was only taking part in the movie as the servant. I was not amused. I was ranting and raving for a week. Why would they give me two parts and take one away? I was going to sue them. I was going to do this and that. And then I kind of processed it, and I realized that the girls who were picked for the uptown roles were very fair-skinned. And all the servants were dark-skinned girls. So I was there to represent the African-American woman who would have been a servant in 1930. I gracefully accepted that role, and I tell you, it was the best thing I ever did for myself. I spent two weeks on set with Peter Jackson, and I watched him spin his magic. The man is a magician. I was so inspired, I resigned from work, found a managing director to run my companies, and I went back to school. I went to film school and did a course in TV and film production. Then I started writing a movie script based on my book. Now, you all have discovered, I see, that there was a book underneath your seat. And I'll share with you how you can keep that copy. I made this promotional video, and it's an illustration of what's possible. So we'll just run this for a minute. Hello, and welcome to Simzi Sani Creations. Simzi Sani is a culturally unique talent agency focusing primarily on black African faces and personalities for the film and advertising industry. Formed in Cape Town, South Africa in 1994, Simzi Sani is now an international operator and is based in Wellington, New Zealand. We offer a wide range of talent, including actors, models, dancers and musicians of African origin, as well as from a diverse range of ethnicities. We can cater for all your on-screen talent needs. 
you can contact us through our website www.simzisanicreations.com. We hope to be hearing from you soon. People didn't turn up for the shoot. I was down to me as a cameraman. I had a friend who was on lights and sound. I had 10 ladies who were supposed to come and dance, and only two showed. And if you look very carefully, I'm dancing as well. <laughs> so I'm the third dancer. It was all because of Peter Jackson. We filmed one piece with me speaking, filmed a piece with me dancing, and put it all together. And that background was all animated. It was just magical. So I started writing this script based on my book. Now, if I go back to my PowerPoint, the book is a fundraising tool. I raise money for HIV orphans in Zimbabwe. Christmas 2004, Oprah was in South Africa. And a girlfriend called me up. My parents had come for Christmas. And she said, get you to switch on the TV. Oprah's in South Africa. And there she was, standing on a soccer pitch full of children, all HIV orphans. And as she opened up her arms, she said, this is the lost generation of Africa. These are children who will never get to go to school. Most of them have lost both parents. Africa needs help. So I said to my mom, how many orphans do we have in our family? And we sat down with pen and paper and found that on my side of the family, we had 49 AIDS orphans. My grandmother had 34 grandchildren. 19 have died from HIV-related diseases. I called up my mother-in-law. Between our two families, we had 89 AIDS orphans. And I said to my husband, I need to find a way I can make money, I can give away unconditionally. I'd been writing this book for 15 years. It started off as a series of thank you letters to all my angels, the magical people who appear and help me through my travels. And the book was published. I started selling it through my motivational speaking and talks. I was speaking at Rotary, Lions, Probus, any group that needed a speaker. So I could sell 100 copies a month. And then the miracle started to happen. I did my research and found that we have 17 million AIDS orphans on the African continent. 1.1 million of those children are from Zimbabwe. Our population is 14 million. And it grew even bigger. People started coming on board. I then registered a charitable trust called the Africa Life Education Foundation. And my vision is to make sure that these kids get to go to school. At the moment, we have 350 children, all situated in my husband's home village, which is Shurugui, in the Midlands of Zimbabwe. This is the school where they go. The school is so run down. It is very hard for me to get these kids to smile, and it's a pity we've got a lot of lighting, but it takes me hours to get them to smile. And the only pictures that you will see are the ones with the smiles. Most of them are sad. Um, it's just so difficult to watch them in those conditions. But what the project has done is children have developed a pride in themselves. This little chap turned up the day I was there, and he came wearing his dad's jacket. Can you see how big that jacket is? <laughs> but whenever I go home and they know I'm coming, everybody dresses up and looks their best. The whole thing about fundraising for Africa and using children with flies on their faces, and people have become so desensitized to that image. People don't respond anymore. And I find that if you can take a picture of a child smiling, you see the soul behind that child's eyes. You see the potential. So that's what goes into our marketing material. So I need to do up the school, and this is part of what tonight is about. The conditions of the classrooms are just shocking. We've got no desks. We need to repaint the school. We need to restock the library. I spent some time there last year, I think almost, yeah, 12 months ago. And I observed that as soon as the children came to class and sat down, they all fall asleep instantly. I said to the teachers, what's wrong with these kids? And she said, most of them eat two or three times a week. 
So we started a feeding program, and the children make their own breakfast. These are some of the girls making the porridge. There's no electricity, there's no running water. But every morning, they make porridge for everybody else, and the children get a feed. This is me and my son handing out spoons. Now, Dumi was 10 at the time. These are children from his age group. They are head and shoulders smaller than him because of malnutrition. And this is the children having their first meal. It was just wonderful being able to do that. It costs 30 New Zealand cents for one bowl of porridge. I've now got 350 children that I support in Zimbabwe. And this is what we got at the end of it. They just turned into little children again. The smiles are just priceless. So I need your help. I signed 700 books. Every single book in this theater has my signature on it. I thought to myself, how can I say thank you to the people who've come tonight? Please buy a book. It's $35. Buy a copy for yourself. Buy one for someone you love. Buy one for somebody who needs inspiring. I can't do this on my own. I have a vision that if I can upgrade this school, I can roll this project out in Zimbabwe. My vision is really to reach the 1.1 million children in my country. We need books. If anybody has children, second-hand books, Put it on the feedback form that's inside that book that you have. Ideas on how I can fundraise. We have 14 teachers in the school, but what we're finding is because teachers aren't being paid, most Zimbabwean teachers are going to work in South Africa as domestic servants. They get higher wages working as a domestic servant in South Africa than teaching in Zimbabwe. So I need to try and subsidize my teachers' wages so they stay. These are the children. The last time I went, we were taking photographs of them, and at the end of it, all of them took off their name tags and put it on their forehead. One child did it, and the next one did it, and the next one did it. And I asked the little one who had started why they did that, and he said, I want to make sure that you don't forget me. And they spent the whole day with these name tags on their heads. And these are the kids that I want to make sure they get to college. We're finding that in Africa, if you can take a child from grade one to grade seven, in countries like Uganda, where HIV and AIDS have slowed down, just because people understand what a virus is, it's making a difference. In those countries, HIV and AIDS is slowing down. A lot of people think that solving the AIDS problem is to throw condoms at Africa. When I started this project, I was 19 years old, and World Health came to our village in helicopters and they were dropping flyers to a population of people who could not read. People would light their fires. They would use the paper to light their fires. So I started teaching people through storytelling because the way we pass down knowledge in Africa is by telling stories. I wrote a play with an AIDS theme and we went from village to village to village educating people about AIDS. It's just a pity that I left and I'm happy that I'm able to do a lot more being here. Now, how many people in this audience have watched a movie called The Secret? Quite a few. I watched The Secret 18 months ago, and The Secret talks about the law of attraction and how you can attract anything you want into your life through your thoughts. Everything starts with you and how you think. When I first watched it, I thought, hmm, let me just try this stuff and see if it works. So I created a vision board in my office of all of the people I wanted to meet. I wanted to meet Mark Victor Hansen and Jack Hanfield. These are two self-published authors, the best self-published authors in the world. They wrote a series of books called Chicken Soup of the Soul. And I thought they must have a method to sell books. They have my how. Literally within two months of cutting out their pictures, I got to meet Mark Victor Hansen. And it was through a friend of mine who had gone to um, Los Angeles, and he met Mark, told Mark about my project. And the coincidence was that Mark had just come back from Africa. He had gone on a safari to Kenya. And on his way back, he was taken to an orphanage on the last day. The largest orphanage in Africa is in Kenya. 
And all they had to do for that day was to hold the babies. We don't have enough people to give the children human contact. And he was just blown away at the crisis that we have. So when he heard I was fundraising through this book, he invited me to Los Angeles. And he taught me how they did it. They got famous authors to endorse them. People who have large databases just to endorse and support whatever you're doing. And you tap into existing databases. So I thought, okay, what if I attracted everybody who took part in the secret? And it was an experiment. I cut out these pictures, put them on my board, and within six months, I had met literally everyone. This man is the man who does the internet marketing stuff. So they do their selling of books through the internet, through teleseminars. I did a course with him. I then met Jack Hanfield through Mark Victor Hansen. One night, we were having dinner with Mark, and a lady to my left says to me, Gertrude, I'm going to church tomorrow. Would you like to come with me? And I had not been in a church in 18 years, but something in my head said, go to church. And I listened. We show up at this church in Los Angeles, and it turned out to be Reverend Michael Beckwith's church. So I got to meet him in person. Then I went to London. I was recruiting doctors in London, and I was giving a presentation somewhere. And a man in the audience said, look, I have an opportunity to bring you back and speak on stage with Bob Proctor and John Demartini. I end up on stage in London in the Palladium Theatre, 3,500 people at the most amazing event. So I started using the principles and the secrets to create what I want. Now, when you read my book, you have to read the last chapter first. I wrote my own obituary. I wrote everything I want to achieve from now until I die at 12067. Everything has started to come true. I said that I'm going to write a screenplay that is going to win Oscars. The book is going to sell millions of copies. I just really went crazy with my projections. The script I'm writing, I've written specific parts for specific actors. Denzel Washington is acting as my husband. I will hopefully be acting as me. <laughs> the most amazing thing happened to us about 18 months ago. My oldest son wants to be an actor, so he goes for all these auditions around the city. And he gets picked to act in a movie pilot. He gets the part, goes for his wardrobe fitting, and they told us Denzel Washington was coming to Wellington to film this pilot. And I thought, oh my gosh, I have him on my vision board. So I told the lady who was casting to tell him that I know him. I took part in a movie called Cry Freedom. Anybody ever watch that? It was filmed in Zimbabwe. I was 19 years old. I had the small walk-on, walk-off part, but I got to meet him before he was famous. And I said, just tell him I was in Cry Freedom. This is my name. Guess who came out to meet me? Denzel Washington comes out and he says, what the hell are you doing in New Zealand? So I told him my story. I told him about my movie script. I said, Denzel, I need you. I need you to act for free. <laughs> he looked at me and he smiled and he said, Gertrude, if I have the time, I'll do it. That's when I realized that I could do this. I decided I want to be the first African person to write, direct, and produce an Oscar award-winning screenplay. It's never been done. I'm not living in Wellington, New Zealand by mistake. The wind did not take me there by mistake. I've been struggling with my script. When Denzel agreed, I went ahead and wrote the Oscar acceptance speech. So <laughs> I know it by heart. I then took it one step further, and um, I was in Los Angeles. I bought my first Oscar. In fact, I've got eight of these in my office. <laughs> Best director, best screenplay, best of everything. <laughs> Do you know, the first time I said this, I was shaking. Second time I said it, it felt good. Third time I said it, it felt real. And every single time I say it, I know it's already done. I've been struggling with the script. So I thought, okay, I live in Wellington. Best script writers are in this city. What can I do? So I went to my mayor, and I said, Mayor Kerry Pendergrass, I need to meet Peter Jackson. I need to meet Fran Welsh, anybody who's in script writing. I had to wait six months to get an appointment with her. But the day I went in to see her, she was meeting Peter on the Monday. 
She gave him my book. She told him my story. Next thing I know, I'm in front of Fran Welsh and Philippa Boyens, the lady who wrote uh, Lord of the Rings and King Kong. I'm now being coached and mentored by Philippa. Isn't life wonderful? They say the most wonderful thing about life is that you get to write the script. Be the director and star in your own epic. And I'm living proof of that. So this is my next aim, and I need all of you to help me with this one. Can you imagine if I got on the Oprah show? Can you just imagine the miracle we could create? <laughs> I found this photograph of Oprah sitting on a couch with her girlfriend, Gail. Gail's gone. I'm there. So what I need you to do tonight when you get home, get on the internet, get onto Oprah's website. If tonight has inspired you in any way, write something about my book. Write something about today's presentation. You could help me create a miracle in a day. Can you imagine if she got 600 emails in one day from Hastings, New Zealand? <laughs> now, I've decided it's September this year because September is my birthing month. I have three children who are born in September, 16, 17, 18. So you've got to help me do this. This is my amazing family, my husband, Barton, and my three kids. My oldest son, Simba, is the one who designed the book cover. I chose the picture because I think I look fine in this picture. And we printed out this fake cover, and he looked at it and he said, Mom, there's something missing in this. And I said, what? He was about 16 at the time. He said, there's just something missing. And he spent the whole night on my computer. He wakes up the next day and he had this big grin on his face and he said, Mom, I finished your book. And he had printed it out and wrapped it around an old book and he handed it to me. And I looked at it and I couldn't see the difference. And he said, hold it back. So if you look at the book and hold it back, you'll realize that he put a watermark of the map of Africa on my face. And he said to me, Mama, I feel as if Africa is tattooed on your soul. And it's the only way I can show it. I get people who buy the book in Paper Plus and they email saying, you know, we bought your book, it's this color, and I tell them, hold it back. <laughs> And my son was 16 at the time, and he's now a graphics design student at Victoria University. He's in his second year. My daughter, Zianda, we call her the matron. She runs the house when mom is running around the city, running around the world fundraising. She is just the most amazing woman. My youngest son, we're not sure who Dumi is going to be. Um, he's a guitarist, electric guitar. I think he's a Jimi Hendrix reincarnate. But we're yet to see what he's going to be. Um, but they support me. They're my team. They prop me up and help me in everything that I do. I wrote a second book after this first book in response to emails that people sent to me. Um, a lot of people emailed and said, Get rid your life has been absolutely wonderful. Does anything ever go wrong? And I realized I had written about all of the positive things that have happened to me in the first book to the point that I didn't talk about any of the crap that has been coming at me in life. <laughs> and I thought, well, how can I write about the crap in a positive way? And this book came out. It's called It's Not About What Happens That Matters, A Practical Guide to Overcoming Life's Challenges. My grandmother used to say that every day comes with a blessing or a teaching. The good things are your blessings. The bad things are your teaching. You learn from anything that's going wrong. It was amazing because when I finished writing it, I got a call from ANZ Bank. You know when the banks merged? One of the bank managers came to a rotary meeting where I spoke, and he said to me, Gertrude, I have 650 people in a building who are not getting on. You have got to come to my organization, motivate my staff, do your thing, he said. So I spent a whole day in ANZ Bank, and he would bring in people in loss of 100, and I'll do this presentation. <laughs> it was the most fascinating thing, but... We sold 350 copies that day. So the book is selling and selling fast. I think there's about three copies out there, and I think they're already gone. But this was the second book that I, um, I published. I'll end my presentation with a little story about me. This is me at the age of six. When I was six years old, I used to love money. I've always loved money. And I called my dad that I could clean out his wardrobe and he could pay me pocket money. 
But what dad would do is he would leave change in his pockets. And I always knew I'd make a chunk of change when I did that. And one day, I'm cleaning out the wardrobe. And I find this old pair of shoes at the bottom of the wardrobe. And I was about to put them in the bin. And dad walks into the bedroom and he said, don't throw away my shoes, those shoes are magic, he said. He sits me on his lap and he pulls out a photograph of himself standing on the steps of the Colosseum in Rome. My father went to Rome in the 60s when most African people couldn't even afford to get on a bicycle. He turned the shoes over and they were completely soulless. There were newspapers at the bottom of the shoes. And he said, do you see the shoes in the photograph? I said, yes. He said, those are the same shoes. My father got on an airplane, went to Rome with a pair of shoes that had no soles. And Dad said to me, all you need to do is dream. If you can see it up here, you can make it real. And that's the principle by which I live. So Dad, I'm really honored that you could be here to watch me live my dream. Tonight is dedicated to my youngest brother. My brother died of AIDS on the 29th of March this year at the age of 13. The average life expectancy of a Zimbabwean is now 27. Can I have a show of hands who is above 27 in this room? I turned 42 this year, and I have lived past my die-by date, and I am grateful. I wake up every morning, and I breathe. And I realize that what I've been given is something I need to pass on to other people. That's why I'm so passionate about this project. So remember to buy a book. Please spread the word for me. They say that one person knows at least 250 other people. You are my advocate. If you hear of anybody who needs a guest speaker, put forward my name. I have a wish list. I had a terrible car accident just before, about 10 days ago. I was supposed to drive here in my car. And there was a four-car pileup on the motorway. My car is an absolute write-off. So if anybody has a car they're selling, please get hold of me. <laughs> Take time to fill out my feedback form, please, and give it back to us tonight. We need people with large databases who are willing to promote the book. We need children's books. We need children's clothing. We need book distributors. If anybody has a bookstore who could stock the book for us. Translations, the book has been translated into Spanish, so I'm doing a Spanish book tour at the end of the year. I'm doing the whole of South America. TV exposure, I want to thank the people who are recording today. I was interviewed this morning, and you are here recording this, so again, thank you, thank you, thank you for everything. Spread the word for me. Any fundraising ideas that you might have, and shop owners where we can sell our products. Some of the product outside has been made by the women in the village where we're supporting the children. So I want to go back home and empower the whole community with this project by giving them microloans so they can start small businesses and export products that are sellable in New Zealand and overseas. So thank you again. My staff are outside. Inside the book is a form. We take cash, check, or credit card. So just fill out the form and leave it with the ladies outside. Buy a book for yourself. Buy one for someone you love, one who needs inspiring. It will make a fantastic Christmas present. It's great as a corporate gift. Thank you again for being here and sharing tonight with me. Thank you. It was fabulous. It was, it was fabulous. I bought the book and I've got my niece and nephew here. It was great. What she's doing is what I would really enjoy to do when I grow up. Um, wonderful, very inspiring and um, uh, she's a very energetic speaker. I really enjoy that aspect of it. It's good. Her physical presence is beautiful and her spirit. Just great. I thought it was wonderful. She was very ins inspirational to get everybody to dare to dream make their dreams happen. It was really good. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, she's 
totally inspirational and it was really lovely to see that she was so emotional about having her father here and um, and obviously the loss of her brother so it's really beautiful thank you i thought it was fabulous and uh, quite inspiring really yeah oh i think we're lucky to um uh, to live in new zealand so you know obviously uh, gertrude's had a had an amazing upbringing and uh, you know shaped the person that you, she is today so it's great to have some of those experiences so. just shows you we've all got it in us we've all got it in us so we've just got to just do it you know never say never we're limited by we're limited by our own imaginations aren't we yeah no it was a really inspiring thing and to see someone coming from that background and achieving what she's achieved is, is amazing so, yeah. Well, we're not, well, compared to her country, we're not struggling. Us Maori think we're struggling, but we haven't got a struggle, really. We're, where she comes from, it's, it's amazing what she's doing. I thought she was really amazing, very inspirational, yes, yes. And what she says is true. You know, you've got to give back what you, yeah, what you get in life and be really appreciative of it, yes. <laughs> that was wonderful, wasn't it? Hey? What a truly inspirational woman. She's great. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I love the, uh, the blessings and teachings. Wasn't that a wonderful yeah. idea? You know, the, the gifts that come to your life are your blessings and the hardships of the teachings. I like that. Cheers. Well, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Please support us. Go online onto our website, www dot africa alive online dot com help us spread the word tell your friends buy the video and thank you again for all your support <laughs>